All right. Hey, everybody. So good to see you guys. Um, today we are actually, isn't it crazy that we are already in the month of March? And to kick off this month, we are starting a four-part sermon series um, that um, is going to go over, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but this four-week four sermon series is titled, The Priesthood of All Believers. The Priesthood of All Believers. It's not the priesthood of some believers. It's not the priesthood of just some super Christians out there. It's for all believers, and it's done through Jesus Christ. So as we go into the next four weeks, uh, I want us to be able to envision what it looks like for us as New Testament believers to approach a God who is holy through the washing and cleansing of Jesus' blood, how we are called to enter in even into the holy of holies without being killed. Does that make sense? We unholy people have no place with a holy God, and we need to approach a holy God according to his terms. And his terms are being washed through the blood of Jesus Christ. So this is what we're going to be going into for the next four weeks. I'm super, super excited to go into this. Now, did you know that you are called to be a priest? The life that you are living after your encounter with Jesus Christ is supposed to resemble that of a priest in some ways. Now, I don't know about you guys, I was born and raised in Chile, and it is a very strongly Roman Catholic country. And so I was raised with this picture of what a priest looks like, right? They've got that collar thing going, they got a robe, they got a funny hat, not funny, um, um, cool hat, and you know, they're, they're like chanting something in Latin, and they're like, their voice is echoing in the cathedral, and that's kind of the picture that I always have of what a priest looks like. Now, this term priest that we see written all over scripture, it comes from a Jewish term called Kohen. Can everybody say Kohen? Kohen. So this is a Jewish, uh, the Hebrew term for priest, and we first see it in the book of Exodus, where believe it or not, this idea of a priesthood was God's provision for an unholy people to be able to meet with a holy God. You know, a few weeks ago, we talked about the hold me back bro moment with, with Moses when he was up on the mountain, and as God through thunder and lightning and a shaking of the mountain uh, in Mount Sinai. He's talking to Moses about how these people are going to be set apart. And as he's doing that, as God is saying, you shall have no other gods before me, you shall make no graven images. As he's saying that, un like under the mountain, people are making graven images. And so they are already failing at these commandments that God is giving. And here's the crazy part about it. Even through that, God still wants to dwell with his people. God still wants to be accessible to his people. And so even if it's idolatrous people who are wanting to worship this golden calf, God makes a provision for his people to meet with him still, even throughout the desert. And that is why he established a priesthood in the nation of Israel. God himself, he makes blueprints for what we call the tabernacle of Moses, which later will become, it's like a prototype of what later will become the temple that's going to be in Jerusalem. And he has given Moses these blueprints, this strategy for a people who are unholy to approach a God who is holy, for the mortal to meet with the immortal, for fallen man to meet with a holy God. And so to sustain this meeting place, he establishes this, for first time in history, a Kohen, a priesthood, to minister to him. And so today's part one of this four-part series is titled, The Calling of a Priest. The Calling of a Priest. Now, especially for someone like me who has preconceived notions of what a priest looks like, I have a very particular mental image of what that looks like, and it looks nothing like me. Like, I feel very distant, very foreign. That's a few steps removed from my reality, my relationship with Jesus. But if we take the Bible for God's word, then it means that there's a truth there that I'm missing out of if I don't see myself as a priest of God. And so today we'll be talking about what does it mean to be a priest. Now, can you turn to your neighbor? I know introverts hate this, but it's okay. You'll survive. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am a priest. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I am a priest too. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Wasn't so hard, was it? 
All right, so now that you so confidently said that you are a priest, we're going to talk about what does it mean to be a priest. And as we answer this question, we'll look through this passage of 1 Peter 2. We'll look at it, the first 10 verses, and we're going to divide it up into three different sections. We're going to approach the first section first, then the third section, and then we're going to end with the sandwich part in the middle. And so for the first part, we're going to go through verses 4 and 5 first. It says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but inside of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what does it mean to be a priest as a New Testament believer? The first thing that we need to know and have assurance of is that he has called us to have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. Direct access to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only mediator you need. Pastors are great. I'll speak for my own kind. They're great. But did you know that you don't need a pastor to access God? We need to know that in, in today's church because sometimes in our minds we're like, yeah, 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 we have direct access to God. Sure. But then in, in function, the way that we act is like, oh, man, man, I got to pray about something. Um, I better go to the holiest person that I know, and they'll have kind of like the, the you know, inside track with God, and they'll be able to put in a good word for me kind of, you know. But let me tell you, as a New Testament believer, if you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, that veil is torn. You no longer need another mediator to get you to God. Jesus Christ is enough. So you as a priest, have been called to have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. In the same way that a priest was in his full right to enter into the outer court, to enter into the holy place, and then the holy of holies, that was his right. You, as a believer, have that same right to approach a holy God. Now, let me give you a, a little bit of a nerd, you know, uh, uh, side uh, aside in church history. Now, in the new testament church in the early church as a church was birthed this idea that you no longer needed a priest to mediate on your behalf but you are now called a priest it was very offensive to the religious establishment because it was saying that instead of going through the liturgy and sacrifice and jumping through the hoops and trying to outdo each other in the piety game so that you could have favor with a holy God, you could now directly look to Jesus, believe in Jesus, and have direct access to God. And you have direct access to the inapproachable holy Yahweh. It was a closing of a gap that had remained for centuries between the sinner and the holy where when Jesus died on the cross, he tore that veil, and now the humble fisherman, the repentant prostitute, the tax collector, the uneducated, the illiterate, the poor, the orphan, the widow, the downtrodden, they now had full access to God through Jesus Christ. To say that this was revolutionary is an understatement. This is massive. This completely shakes the foundation of established religion in that time. Now, as fate would have it, we fast forward 1,500 years into the 1500s in Europe, and by then, the Church of Jesus Christ, in what we now know as the Roman Catholic Church, it has changed over the centuries, and it has become the very thing they were birthed to confront. So in the 1500s, the church had become a religious and educated elite that had access to God. The Word of God was handwritten, and it was in Latin, and so it was very, very rare and inaccessible to most people. The majority was illiterate. And on top of that, it was in Latin. So the fact that, you know, you and I have this kind of free access to a Bible that is written in whatever version we want, in whatever language we want, we have it in all of our phones, that was unheard of. To them, having access, direct access to the Word of God was unheard of. And so the uneducated and illiterate masses, they were... They were one step removed from being able to enter in fully into an understanding of what faith was about. And there were also things in place like, I don't know if you guys have studied this before, indulgences. Indulgences where people paid the church for their forgiveness of their sins. So they said, man, I committed a really bad sin this, pa uh, sin this past week. I'm going to have to pay extra this week to be cleansed. And so there was a payment method 
payment method for you. If we ever did that, you guys, like you can call this a cult. <laughs> like this is not Christian. The payment of sins, and even if, you know, you had somebody, one of your, you know, relatives, they were deceased and they passed away, and, you know, in Roman Catholic belief, they don't go straight to heaven if they believe in Jesus, they actually go to purgatory, and they're going to be there, and as long as they um, pay for all these extra masses that are going to be conducted on their behalf, they're going to be in purgatory for a long time. And so richer people could afford to have more sins forgiven. They could afford to have, you know, their relatives be, quote unquote, you know, can redeem from purgatory and then brought into heaven. All of these things were part of the Roman Catholic faith. And the worship of the Pope and the authority of the Pope was on par with authority of the word of God. It was side by side. If something that the Pope decreed wasn't in line with the scriptures, it still held up. That was the extent of the authority of the Pope. And it was in this context that the Protestant Reformation explodes into the scene with figures, if you've heard of Martin Luther and John Knox and John Calvin and uh, Zwingli, all of these guys, it comes onto the scene at the heels of the printing press making the Bible more readily available, and at the heels of English translation in the common language being, uh, the Bible being translated at that time. And so all of a sudden, people who felt like, man, if I don't have money, I can't get to God. Man, if I'm not good with a priest or the Pope, then I can't access God. All of a sudden, God became very accessible to the majority of people. And so out of this, in the Protestant evangelical religion, you know, as, um, uh, as it was established during the Protestant Reformation, there are five different pillars that they kind of established as their foundation. One, it, they're all in Latin. One is sola scriptura. It means only scripture. Scripture alone has authority. It doesn't matter what the Pope says doesn't matter what your pastor says. If it's not in line with the word, it has no weight. It has to align with the word of God. And so, sola scriptura, scripture alone has that authority. Solus Christos. So Christ alone is able to reconcile you with the Father. It's not through indulgences. It's not through paying these things off. It's not through all these Hail Marys. and, and what. No, it's Christ alone that is going to reconcile you to the Father. Third is sola fide, faith alone. It is through faith alone that you can grab a hold of the mercy of Jesus Christ and be reconciled to the Father. Fourth is sola gratia, so grace alone. Through grace alone are we able to once again be reconciled to the Father. And lastly, glory to God alone. Glory to God alone. Is saving grace. Glory to God alone in the way that he redeems the saints. And so scripture alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. Those are the five pillars that were established during the Protestant Reformation. And men and women laid down their lives. They were burned at the stake. They were persecuted. And they had to fight the established religious power to stand upon these truths. These are some things that we take for granted today. But men and women laid down their life in order for us to have this kind of faith today. So now we fast forward 500 years after the Reformation, right, to the church today. And there's some aspects in modern Christianity that sometimes they echo the errors of the Pharisees in Jesus' day and the religious elites in the Protestant Reformation times. I'm going to give you a very uncomfortable example. I'm all for honor and respect and structure and authority, but putting pastors on a pedestal, worshiping Christian celebrities, taking anyone's word as if it was on par with the word of God is backwards and is heretical. As a New Testament believer, you need to know that the only authority that I have as a pastor is as long as I'm standing upon the word of God. The moment I step out of that, I no longer have authority. Every message that you hear preached from this pulpit, you better be going back home and looking at the Bible and making sure that I'm in alignment with the Bible as well. Because don't you can't just take my word for it just because I'm holding a mic, right? You need to know the word for yourself. And as long as things line up with the scripture of God that that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, that's when, authority, that's when there is truth and substance there. Because 
Anybody could get up on a platform, grab a mic, and dazzle anybody with fancy footwork and, and, and cool illustrations and, and whatnot. But if it doesn't stand on the word of God, it is not a sermon. It is not the word of God. It is not preaching. And so putting pastors on a pedestal, putting Christian celebrities on a pedestal, that is borderline Roman Catholic, I would say. It, it's, it's so funny to think about it that way, but that's kind of what it looks like. It's like, oh, if it's the Pope or if it's a pastor or if it's someone with, you know, at least five million followers, whatever it looks like, if you put their word on par with the word of God, that is heretical. And so we need to know that we have full access to the word of God, and that is going to be the ultimate authority in our lives. Now, I don't know if it's also because I was raised in a strongly Roman Catholic kind of environment, but it reminds me, the way that sometimes we view Christian leaders and Christian figures, it, it reminds me almost of, uh, you know, the cult of the saints, the way that, you know, Roman Catholics will, will worship saints, and I would see this growing up all the time. There'd be, you know, like statues here and there. There'd be, you know, um, kind of altars here and there. And people would actually go to these different saints and, and, and place some kind of offering. They would light candles, whatever the case may be. It's like, oh, St. Teresa, well, she has like an inside track with God. And so I need to appeal to her and then maybe God will accept me. It was this additional mediator, additional mediator that almost says to you, like, is, is Jesus not enough? Why do you need to go to St. Peter or St. Saint, Saint John? All these people are very important in history, and th they made a huge contribution to our understanding of Christianity, but they must not be worshipped. They cannot be a mediator to God. It's like saying that Jesus and what he did on the cross is not sufficient for us to bridge that gap. And so let me ask you a question. Is Jesus Christ as a mediator, as a sacrificial lamb, as a one who at the cross said, it is finished. It's not partially finished. It's not, man, if only you do all these extra stuff, then it will be finished. He said, it is finished. Is his mediating work on the cross not enough? Or do you need a saint to plead on your behalf? Or do you need a pastor to mediate on your behalf? Do you need another mediator to come in between you and God in order for you to be reconciled? Now, I understand that we need to ask for prayer from others. That's not what I'm talking about. I think we actually need to do more of that. We need to be asking for prayer from one another even more. I understand the place of honor and structure and authority and discipleship and supporting those who are younger in the faith and the body of Christ. I understand all of that. I understand the interconnectedness of the body of Christ and how desperately we need each other and we can't do the Christian life alone as an island. So that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is if... A pandemic was to break out tomorrow and wiped out the entire pastor population in the world. Would you have the assurance to know that you still have full access to God without a pastor there? Would you still have the confidence that you have the fullness of the Holy Spirit residing within you and that you still have full access to God's word? You still have full access to God the Father in God the Son through God the Holy Spirit. There isn't a level of super Christians that get special access and a backstage pass to the Father. Every believer, whether you've been a believer for five minutes or five decades, you've been called to draw near, to make spiritual sacrifices to God the Father through Jesus. You have direct access to God. Now, whether you take that invitation to draw close or not, that's up to you. But you have been given away. You, that road has been opened. That veil has been torn. And I'm here to say that it's open for you. It's accessible to you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and he has washed you clean of your sins through his blood, then you can get as close to God as you want. It, it, does that make sense? Sometimes we make all these tears of Christians in our minds. And we feel like, man, maybe along year five, I'll get bumped up a level. <laughs> Maybe I need to pay my, maybe if I do extra prayers, maybe I'll get bumped up here. And that's not how it works. You are, you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That veil is completely torn and you have full access to God the Father. So that's the first thing that it means to be a priest. If you as a New Testament believer are a priest of God, it means you have full access to God through Jesus Christ. Second thing, what does it mean to be a priest? It also means that he has called us to be active members of the body of Christ active members of the body of Christ. 
you can't have a lazy priest in the temple. You know, you can't have somebody who's becoming dead weight. You can't. Every priest has a purpose and has um, a, a goal, and, and there's a reason why he's there. Verses 9 through 10, it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. It means that we as a priesthood of God, we have a mission. We have an assignment, and that is to proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness, who called all of us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That is the mission of a priest, of a New Testament believer. It's not just for the pastor. It's not just for the Bible study teacher. It's not just for a house church facilitator. It's for all of us because all of us are now called priests of God. In Exodus 28, God established for the first time in human history something called a priesthood, right? The Kohen, a people who be henceforth set apart, consecrated, marked for a specific purpose to be able to enter into the raw and glorious presence of God, to minister to him, to know him, to move him, and then to come out of that meeting place transformed with something to contribute to the body of believers and to the world. That means that you and I, we have a mission and a purpose and an assignment as a priest of the Lord. The first was to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God, and now the second is to proclaim the excellencies of him who's called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. It means, hey, you've seen his glory, now you proclaim his glory. You've experienced his mercy, now you proclaim his mercy. You've heard of his excellencies, now you proclaim his excellencies. I'm going to make this very clear. There are no spectators in the kingdom of God. There's no one who's sitting back with a bag of popcorn kind of watching things unfold. All of us have been called to be priests of the Lord. Now, this is something that we see a lot in modern-day Christianity, and that is this notion of consumer Christianity. Consumer Christianity. First of all, consumer Christianity is an oxymoron. It should not make sense, right? First of all, because there's nothing more opposite to each other than a consumer and a Christian. A consumer and a Christian are directly opposed in what they are. So consumer Christianity should not make sense to us at all. You're either a consumer or you're a Christian. A consumer takes for their gain. A Christian lays down their life. A consumer shops around for the best bargain, the best bang for their buck. They'll haggle, they'll work the system, they'll try to pay the least in order to gain the most. But a Christian knows that they have found that which is of infinite value, and it'll cost them their very lives. They lay it all down. They're not there trying to haggle, well, can I give you half of my life? Can I give you 30% of my life? Can I give you just this area of my life? A Christian is a person that lays down 100% of their life at the cross. So the notion of consumer Christianity should not make sense to us. The fact that that is a modern day, almost like invention, that should boggle our minds. That should not make any sense. Because we as Christians, we're not here to be catered or to be entertained. Everything that happens here on stage on every given Sunday is not so that you kind of leave the church saying, oh, wasn't that a lovely song? Or like, oh, that little speech, that was like very moving. It's not for you to consume a product and then walk away like a satisfied consumer. It is for you to be raised up and equipped to do the ministry of God. The role of pastoral staff, the role of the elders, the role of leaders here isn't to actually do the work of the ministry, let me tell you. It's to equip y'all <laughs> to do the work of the ministry. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 16, it says, God gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love, rather y'all speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint which, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Does that make sense? It means the role of pastoral staff, the role of the elders, the role of the leaders is to equip the body of Christ. The body of Christ has functions. The body of Christ has parts, and all of the parts need to play their role. We need to normalize today, we need to normalize this idea that believers need to take their faith seriously. We are called to live as Christians and live as priests Monday through Sunday. None of this, you know, like I'm a Christian for an hour and a half when I'm at that little building. You are a Christian Monday through Sunday. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you are a priest, just in the same way like Aaron back in, you know, in, in Exodus, even if he were to take off his priestly garments, he's still a priest. And so it doesn't matter if you're in this building or not, you're still a Christian. You're a Christian in your workplace, when you're commuting, when you're interacting with a cashier at a grocery store, when you talk to friends in your classes, you are a Christian and you are a priest, whether you feel like you're on the clock or not. If consumer Christianity isn't an option for us, then Sunday Christianity isn't an option either. Just like once you're a priest, you can just you know, take off your robes and no longer be a priest, you can't just step out of a church and assume that you're no longer a Christian. A priest is an identity. It's not a job that you clock into and clock out of. And a Christian witness, a Christian believer, is not something that you can just take off and compartmentalize in your life. You are a Christian, and therefore you are a priest. You have said this before, in, in some previous messages, the church is not a cruise. It's not a cruise ship on its way to heaven. It's a battleship stationed at the gates of hell. We're not here to sing kumbaya until Jesus comes. We're not here to just, hey, let's just coast this thing until either I die or, or Jesus comes back. One of those two things happen. We're not here to coast on our way to heaven, there is an assignment and a mission for the church. It is a battleship stationed at the gates of hell. It's stationed there to push back the gates of hell to advance the kingdom of God. So if you think that your journey as a believer is just to coast and it's going to be a walk in the park and hopefully, you know, nothing unexpected happens, then you're in for a very rude awakening. God has called you to be an integral part of the body of Christ. The body of Christ can't afford to have an unfunctioning shoulder or a lazy kneecap, or a foot that just gets dragged along for the ride. The body of Christ needs all parts to be working, to be strengthening one another, to be joined together through Jesus, our head. We need one another, and we need to be Jesus Christ and his excellency. We need to be sharing our testimony. We need to be witnessing through our lives. We need to be serving. We need to be praying that the kingdom of God would advance and the name of Jesus would be lifted high. This is not a pastor's role. This is a believer's role, a believer's role. And so lastly, if being a priest doesn't just mean that you have direct access to God, and it doesn't just mean that you're called to be an active member of the body, but as we do this, we are called to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, our great high priest. We cannot do any of those things if our eyes are off of Jesus. He has called us to look to him, our great high priest. I love how earlier this morning, you know, before service, well, we have a short prayer gathering, and that's, you know, every, anyone is welcome to come. We have a prayer gathering from 1030 in the morning, and Eugen was leading us today in that, and she brought scripture to share with us from Hebrews chapter 9, and it just fits so perfectly here. You know, Hebrews chapter 9, I'm just going to read it for you, verses 11 through 14. It says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of creation. He entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of persons with ashes and heifer, sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more with the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. How perfect is that? 
You know, over the next few weeks, we'll be studying the, the tabernacle of Moses, its different parts, and what it means for priests to minister to them, what it means for us. What does a bronze altar mean? What does the bronze basin mean? The, the table of showbread, the incense, the lampstand. We're going to journey together from outside into the outer courts, through these thresholds, right? Into the outer courts, and then into the holy place, and then to the holy of holies. And we're going to journey together into the heart of God. We will work, uh, we'll journey together as a priest did. And as we do that, we'll slowly unfold what it means to be called the priest of God. And we'll see the imprint of Jesus everywhere in this tabernacle. It's going to be really glorious. Jesus is the showbread. Jesus is the veil. Jesus is the lampstand. Jesus is the sacrifice. Everywhere you look, Jesus is there. And so for Peter, in this passage, he puts this corner piece, this, this center piece into the middle of this passage, verses 6 through 8. He says, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. As we start the sermon series, it's very important for us to start with the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. Here, you know, Peter is quoting Isaiah 28, a chapter that is indicting the rulers in Jerusalem, where God says, you think you're powerful? You think you can get away with injustice? You think you're teaching the truth? I am going to set a cornerstone in Zion, and it will become a stumbling block for you. And so Peter is saying, as he's quoting Isaiah 28, Peter is saying, Jesus Christ alone is a cornerstone, and you will either be built on him or you will be stumbled by him. You will either be a living stone on the foundation of Christ or you will be offended by him. Peter is saying, if you believe in Jesus, he is your everything. If you don't believe in him, he's a stumbling block and a rock of offense. If you believe in him, he is all. It all rises and falls on Jesus, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his future return. But if you don't believe in him, he is a rock of offense. The ridicule, the sacrifice, the blood shed on the cross, it is an offense. It is uncomfortable and awkward and jarring for the unbeliever because it confronts you with your sinfulness and your brokenness and your need for forgiveness when all you want to do is feel like a good enough person. If Jesus Christ is indeed your cornerstone, it's that first stone set on the ground, this first stone in any building, it determines what the building, where the building is going to be, how it's going to be oriented and directed. It's going to determine every other stone that is built upon it. That first stone upon which an entire building is raised, if Jesus Christ is this cornerstone, then it means three things. It means first, Jesus is the first in order. He is the firstborn of the brethren. He is the one who made a way where there was no way. Second, Jesus is the first in importance. He is the one thing. He's not one of many things. He is the one thing. He's the only one that can satisfy. He is the all-sufficient Savior. His grace is enough. He is in all and through all and holds it all together. He is first in importance. And lastly, Jesus is first in our direction. He is the ultimate goal. He's our ultimate reward. That's where we're headed to as a church. He's the ultimate desire and the ultimate name that is enthroned above every other name. The whole building is built on this direction of this cornerstone. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says, since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted, and, uh, tempted as we are and yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Isn't this an amazing invitation that is laid before us as New Testament believers and as the priesthood of God. We're called to behold our great high priest in all his glory, in all his humility, in all his power, in all his sacrifice. 
We're called to be priests of God as we follow the example set by Christ, as we walk the path open to us by Christ, as we bear witness of the incredible saving work of Christ, and as we live this life all the way to the end until we see Christ. You and I are priests with full access to the presence of God if we will accept that invitation. You and I are empowered to proclaim his excellencies, and you and I are called to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, our great high priest. I'm going to invite up our praise team back again. And I believe, you know, God has something very special in store for us throughout the sermon series. I believe God wants to rewire some things in us. I think if we've grown up in the church for long enough, there's certain things that we're kind of used to, certain expectations that we've grown up with, certain things that we believe, oh, that is for some other Christian. That's for some other person that might be closer to God. And all of these things are just so wired into us depending on how we were raised. And so I believe that throughout the next few weeks, God is going to be doing some rearranging in our hearts. My prayer is that we would walk out of here with this confidence of, I have full access to God the Father. Like as preposterous as that sounds, as hard as that sounds to believe, I have the same access to God the Father as that pastor or as that Christian leader or as that prayer warrior or as that missionary. I have that same access. The Bible says, hey, Elijah was just a man and God answered this prayer. All these people in the Bible, they are, they are just men. They're mortals and yet they touched the heart of God and yet they entered into the holy place. How much more we as New Testament believers who have been washed clean by the blood of a lamb how much more will we have access to that? I want us to do something very interesting as we close out today. You know, earlier today as we were singing um, and, and as Brian and the team were, were leading us through worship, I don't know, maybe it's something about today, but I feel like my heart is like especially tender towards, like I, I just woke up with this feeling of like, man, I just really want to see Jesus today. I really want to see him afresh. I want to experience him afresh. And as the praise team was leading us through, you know, the song Man of Sorrows, I was closing my eyes and I was singing and I felt like in my mind's eye I could slowly start seeing the image of Jesus Christ on the cross more and more like emerge out of the shadows. I could start seeing the silhouette I could start seeing the ostrich arms. I could see the, the, the crown of thorns. I could see the crucifixion more and more clearly. And as I was beholding Jesus Christ, I just had this fresh wave of, man, what Jesus has done, what he has laid down on behalf of the church and on behalf of, of me and, and us. Like, I need that to impact my heart once again. I need my my heart to be tenderized towards the gospel once again and so what I'm going to ask us to do is just to close our eyes and I'm going to read from Luke chapter 23 I'm just going to read through the crucifixion uh, narrative and I want us you know in the room just to close our eyes and try to picture it as clearly as possible that this is the ultimate act of sacrifice that our great high priest went through so that we could now be called priests. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 23. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. 
there was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are justly so, for we are receiving the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the woman who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance, watching these things. Jesus, we gaze upon you today, our great high priest, our great undefiled, spotless sacrifice, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. We behold you in your humility. We behold you in your patience, in your glory, in your power, as you dismantle the powers of hell through one act of sacrifice on the cross. We behold a king who laid down his life for his bride. We behold a great high priest who opened up a way for us. And we today are just like those two robbers crucified at your side. That is what we are justly owed. That is what we are due. And yet turning to you and believing in you is what it takes to make all the difference. If we find ourselves feeling self-condemnation today, we turn and we look to the Christ. We turn and we look to the who blessed us on the cross. We feel arrogant and self-justified like that other thief. We also turn and look to Christ, the one who was blameless and he became sin on our behalf on that cross. We fix our eyes on Jesus the one who has defeated every power, the one who gave up his life for us, that we would be reconciled to the Father, that we will be called sons and daughters, the one who through his blood ransomed us and rescued us from the darkness and pulled us out into his marvelous light. Father, I ask that that would be our boast today. That would be the place, Lord God, our source and our fountain. That would be the place of grace and mercy. That would be the place of humility and empowerment. That would be the place, Lord God, where we know that we have found a new life and a fresh beginning and a new future. We look to Jesus Christ today, and we ask, God, that as we fix our eyes on you, God, you would strengthen your body to become the priesthood and the body of Christ that you've called her to be. A people will proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. God, make us your bride. Make us a priesthood. Make us a holy nation. Would you have your way in us, God? We thank you, Father, for today. We pray all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Can we rise to our feet as we close out today with a song of worship?